Hey everyone, my name is Jessica and I'm a public education specialist at the Fort Worth Public Library. Today we're going to be conducting some experiments using frugal science. What is frugal science? Manu Prakash, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Gates faculty scholar, champions frugal science a philosophy that inspires the development and distribution of affordable scientific tools such as paper microscopes and plastic centrifuges to regions around the globe. Why is frugality important for science? Well, for one thing, lab equipment is very expensive and requires special training. Not everybody has access to the equipment or the training. Can you think of any places like that? Maybe in a desert without electricity, or rainforest where transportation is hard because the roads change seasonally. What may result from increasing accessibility of medical equipment in spaces that experience resource barriers? Are there any other solutions you can think of to getting medical equipment to underdeveloped countries? These are the questions Frugal Science tries to answer. Today, we're going to focus on making a prototype of the paper centrifuge. A centrifuge is a machine that uses centrifugal force a force that pushes mass on the outside of a curved path to separate fluids of different densities or solids from liquids. Think of how you move to the side of the car on a sharp turn, or how the fare ride that spins in place keeps you pinned to the wall. This is the same concept we will be applying to separate masses in a sample solution. One of the most common uses for a centrifuge is in a medical setting to test blood for the volume of red blood cells, which is called a hematocrit test. Hematocrit levels are a diagnostic measurement used to determine a variety of conditions such as anemia and dehydration, which present markers for serious diseases such as leukemia, malaria, and various blood disorders. Centrifuges are also used for simulating g-force and training astronauts and pilots. The faster a centrifuge spins, the more gravitational force is concentrated on the rotating part of a mechanism. Centrifuges play a role in your day-to-day -day life as well, such as in your washing machine when it spins the wet laundry to drain out the wastewater, or separating cream from milk, or in the oil industry, centrifuges are used to separate solids from the drilling fluid. Depending on the use of the centrifuge, they can be wildly out of budget for many individuals, much less for communities. The weight, space, and electricity this piece of machinery involves creates lots of problems for mobility and accessibility. So, what principles are going into a centrifuge that are replicable outside of a laboratory? First, we have RPM, or rotations per minute. When an object spins, each spin is a rotation. Rotation per minute is how many times a centrifuge can rotate in a minute. A whirly gig, which is the prototype design we'll be using, can reach up to 1500 RPM with known modification. To perform a hematocrit test, the centrifuge reaches up to 12,000 RPM. Next, we have the circular shape. Circles are an efficient shape for spinning. Lastly, there is energy. Electricity is powering the centrifuge, but what are alternative energy sources that are widely available? Kinetic energy is energy from motion and is what we'll be using today with our project. After considering your constraints, of the principles we just mentioned and circumstances of a population constrained by resource access, mobility, and lack of electricity, what ideas do you have for a solution? Manu Prakash, the innovator behind the original paper centrifuge, or the paper fuge, explored a variety of solutions before landing on a toy we call the whirly gig. The button whirly gig is a spinning toy powered by twisting a string threaded through the button holes to make the button spin one way and then the opposite way. The RPM of a whirly gig is comparable to the lab equipment used in a standard medical setting. For today's activity, we will prototype our own paper centrifuges with household materials and test their efficacy on some household solutions. Our prototypes will not be powerful enough to do the work that a paper fuge can, but it will do well with the types of solutions we'll be trying out today. You will need cardstock, a CD, scissors, centrifuge sample tubes, a clear dropper, kite string, tape, butter, tomato paste, milk, and water. First, we need to trace a circle onto cardstock. 
Use a CD as a template or draw a circle 12 centimeters in diameter. That's four and three quarters of an inch in diameter. Be sure to draw a circle in the middle of the CD as well. Cut the trace circle with your scissors. Tape over the inner circle in the center of your template. This will reinforce the part of the centrifuge that needs to be the strongest. Using a sharp pencil or thumbtack, poke four holes in a cross pattern on the inner circle of your template. Cut two four and a half foot lengths of kite string. Using your sharp pencil, work the string into opposite holes on one side of the paper circle. Securely double knot the kite string to form a loop. Work the remaining kite string in with your pencil with the leftover holes like so. Tie off this loop and observe how the strings overlap on each side of the circle. Okay, so we are going to start preparing our samples. I have my one tablespoon of water, uh, craft stick so I can mix in my tomato paste. My butter is nice and melted and homogenous, and by homogenous I just mean it is just all goopy, one nice color. That bright yellow, that's what you want. I have my milk, and I don't need a lot because these samples are going to be very small. And then I have a cup of warm water so I can clean my pipette between preparing samples. So I'm going to do my messiest one first. Now I want you to get about a half teaspoon of tomato paste or even spaghetti marinara sauce. I have my half teaspoon right here. And I'm just going to mix it up with my tablespoon of water. And I'm going to keep mixing it until it's like the butter, just one nice mixture with no pieces really sticking out. So don't be surprised if this takes some time. All right, and now you can see it's one nice red color. There's no real big chunks, nothing that can get stuck in the pipette. So I want to get this filled to the 0.3 milliliter line. It's that middle one right there. First, I'm going to get my milk and I'm only going to get about that much. It's not a lot. measure to 0.3 milliliters. Perfect. And you'll hear this split snap close. Perfect. If you don't hear that snap, you're gonna get your samples all over the place. So definitely make sure you snap that close. And I have prepared my first sample. I'm going to rinse this out in my warm water and I'm going to move on to the butter. And again, you don't need a whole lot for a sample. Just fill it to the 0.3 milliliter line. Oh, that was quick. Snap it closed. And 
there's my sample. And you get this little air bubble, you can just kind of do that to move it along. And there's my sample of butter. It's a little bit more than 0.3 milliliters, but I think we'll be okay with this. I'm gonna clean out my pipette and get my last sample of the tomato paste mixture. There you go. I'm gonna let that clean. Snap this one closed. And there is that last sample. And now we're ready to attach it to our paper centrifuge. Now I have these marks. This is so we know where to attach our samples and keep them from getting off balance whenever we twirl our paper centrifuge. So I'm going to put one sample on this side here and another sample on this side so it will be very well balanced. The first two samples I want to use are my tomato paste and my milk. I want the pointed part of your sample tube to go on the outside. Get my other piece of tape. Again, putting that on the outside. You can use any kind of tape, but this clear tape is very good to use because you can observe the samples without damaging your paper centrifuge by taking the tape off. All right, now we're going to spin this for a minute. Okay, so now we have our paper centrifuge. It's ready to go. Our samples are secured onto opposite sides of the plate and opposite sides of the circle for balance. This is going to be very important and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, before we get started, I want to make sure that you guys see how our loops are being held together. And then you kind of want to make sure it's kind of centered. And what we're going to do is wind it up to spin. So I just let gravity do the work for me. And I want to let these little strings get taut enough that I can feel them on my fingers where I'm holding them. You can practice different ways to hold it. There's no right or wrong way. But what I'm looking for is creating these little energy coils. If you look, you see they coil in on themselves. This is potential kinetic energy. And this is what we'll be using to spin. So I've got my coils, I'm ready to go. And there's a little bit of practice to this, so don't feel bad if you don't get this right away. First, I'm going to pull and let the string hold loose. Notice how I let the string get slack so it can spin again. The paper fuse is capable of going much faster than this, but this is our first prototype, so that's fine. And when you really start to pick up speed, you'll be able to hear it. So I'll be quiet now so you can hear it. Once you get a really good rhythm going and you feel like you're going fast enough, I want you to do this for a minute with two of your samples. And it's been about a minute, so let's make some observations. Ah, yes, that's very good. You can see here the particles are separating here because of the motion of the paper centrifuge. The particles of the tomato paste are actually sinking at the bottom of the water. Let's look at the milk. Our milk still looks pretty much like regular milk. If I flip it upside down, you can see some particles are just hanging out at the bottom, that tip right there. That is mostly just the surface tension of the milk. And I don't know about you, but I don't see any particle separation. This milk might just be mixed too well. We'll see. Let's try to run these samples again. And this time we're gonna do it for five minutes. All right, so now we're gonna make some observations. Sample, you can actually see the solids starting to clump together on the tomato paste sample. This is what a centrifuge does, but with your red blood cells in a hematocrit test, which is what we're comparing our prototype to. 
Let's take a look at the milk. The milk looks about the same. I don't see any separation of color. When I turn it upside down, oh, look at that. It's kind of thickening and becoming more viscous. That may be because we're clumping together some of the milk fats. See how this doesn't want to go down? I don't think that's surface tension anymore. For the most part, it looks pretty much the same. So, for our next bit of the experiment, I'm going to leave the milk on here, and I'm going to switch the tomato paste out with our butter sample. And you can see here, it's kind of starting to harden because it's been at room temperature. So if it starts to do that, just kind of roll it around in your hands until it gets liquidy again. Your body heat should be enough to warm up the sample and put it back in a liquid state. We don't want the butter in a solid state because it wouldn't be able to separate out the different particles of the butter. All right, so it's been a minute. We are going to make some observations and oh wow, look at that. You can see here that the fat of the butter has collected on the outside of this paper centrifuge right in this little pointy part. And then let's look at our milk again. Again, not a whole lot of change. It is looking like this tip stuff up here will stay. And that might actually be because of the milk fat is starting to precipitate or collect at the bottom of this vial. What's interesting is both of these materials are dairy products and one of our samples is much more pronounced or obvious than the other. Now we're going to spin for five minutes. I don't know about you guys, but my hands are getting tired. And look at that. You can see with our butter sample that all the fat looks like it's precipitated down to the bottom. It's collecting in the tip of this little vial. And it also looked like all of that exposure to the air dried it a little bit or cooled the butter down to a solid state again. Let's look at our milk. Again, it doesn't look like a whole lot's changed. The color's the same. It is sticking quite a bit more to... It is sticking quite a bit more to the tip of the vial. I'm going to tap it to see. Oh, there it goes. So it does seem like the milk is thickening. It might just be that our paper centrifuge isn't powerful enough to separate the fats out of 2% milk. You could also try different stamp samples, such as heavy cream, whipping cream, half and half. This concludes our experiment. Now let's compare our results and make some more observations. I think our two most dramatic samples are the butter and the tomato paste and water mixture, where you can actually see a solid particle of tomato paste down at the bottom of this vial. It doesn't seem to me like there was a whole lot of difference between spinning our samples for a minute versus spinning for five minutes. And the milk got spun for all of 12 minutes if you count the first minute and this last time it was included in the experiment. And it doesn't seem to have made that big of a difference at all. So I'm interested to see what your results are does a minute make a difference? Does five minutes make the, dip, the sample more obvious? I'm interested to see your results. I don't know if all of ours would be the same. I think it comes down to how well you can spin your paper centrifuge and how your prototype is made. Now that you've prototyped your first paper centrifuge, can you think of any other equipment that may be recreated without requiring electricity? 
It's easy to take our resources for granted when they're so readily available. But now that you know the solution to this particular issue of getting testing equipment to places without electricity, what other areas of study can you think of that may be missing in your own life? What ways could you go about gaining access? That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed engineering a vital tool on a frugal budget. See you later.